Hi everyone, my name is Moni. And I'm Naveen from Before You Play. And today we're going to be showing you how to play a game that is currently on Kickstarter called the Paradox Initiative. This game is designed by Brian Suri and published by Elf Creek Games who are sponsoring this tutorial. And this is a re-implementation of a game that came out back in 2016 and now it's currently on Kickstarter. Yeah, that game is called The Paradox, Paradox. and it's by the same designer. And they're going to be uh, implementing several design changes to the gameplay as well as just the overall look of the game. They've uh, worked with several artists from the industry. And if you're interested in learning more about the campaign as well as the artists that they've worked with, they're going to be doing an artist reveal each day of the campaign, which launches on April 12th. Now, we do want to make note that this is a prototype copy of the game, so things are subject to change in the final copy. As well, if you are interested in this campaign, there will be a link in the description so you can check it out at your leisure. And last but not least, if you do like these kind of videos and you want to see more in the future, please consider subscribing. And with that, we are ready to begin. So if you would please direct your attention to the center of the table, we're all set up here for a technically a multiplayer game of the Paradox Initiative, mm -hmm. although we only have one player set up right here. Yep. The wormhole, which is the card drafting area over here, is set up as if it is a three player game. Mm -hmm. And so just to kind of give you the lay of the land, we've already introduced you to the wormhole, which is over here. In the middle of the table, we have the main board that houses all the different planets or worlds in this worlds. multiverse. Mm -hmm. Because in this game, players are going to be competing to score the most amount of points by completing timelines of specific planets while trying to make sure that they stay not fractured mm -hmm. or essentially protect them from harm, right. which will all make sense in a second. Each player is also going to have their own Paradox console, which is going to house the cards that they draft from the wormhole to categorize according to whether the card is past, present, future, or a Nexus card. And of course, we also have our own matrices or matrix mm -hmm. where we are going to be configuring Paradox tokens in order to create strands and... Uh, acquire resources, essentially. Now, before we talk about gameplay, let's take a look at the anatomy of a timeline card. Timeline cards are going to be the main ways in which you're going to score points in this game. Each card has a letter at the very bottom of the card that correlates to the specific planet that's on the multiverse board here. And so like we were mentioning, each planet has four different cards that complete each set. So this card is specifically the future card mm -hmm. for that B uh, lettered planet. There's also a past, present, and a nexus card that belong to that specific planet. In addition, at the top left-hand corner of each card, it tells you what kind of resource and how many you need in order to score the card. So in this example, it requires me to have one yellow paradox token. And lastly, the top right-hand corner of the card shows a symbol that pertains specifically to research goals, which are going to be public objectives that also help you score points at the end of the game. Now, the significance of these cards is how you're going to score points at the end of the game. If you have one in the timeline, you're going to score one point, two is is worth three points, three is worth six points, and if you have all three plus the Nexus card, that's going to be 10 points. Yes, and that is all cards from the same planet. Mm -hmm. Now, the way that the game works is each round is divided into two different phases. The wormhole phase, where we're going to be drafting cards, and the matrix phase, where we're going to be configuring our matrix, trying to get resources. Now, starting with the first player, known as the Chief Scientist, and continuing clockwise, we're going to start the round in the wormhole phase by drafting cards from the wormhole area. And this is going to be done in a snake-like fashion. So with the three-player game, it's going to be me, then Naveen, then the third player, who will go twice in a row, back to Naveen, and then end with me. Mm -hmm. So say we are the Chief Scientist today, and we're going to go first. Our name, by the way, is Gilzib Twook. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and draft a card from the wormhole. Okay. Now I see two timeline cards in the wormhole that pertain to World B. So that might be a nice one for me to start with, because it'll help in uh, completing the sets, as long as none of my opponents take the other B card, right? right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and start by drafting this card right here. It is a future card, which means I'm going to go ahead and place this card under the future section of my Paradox console. The significance of this console is it's kind of a time limit for me to collect the resources that I need in order to score the card. At the end of each round, each card in my console is going to move down a space. So this future card is going to move to danger if I'm not able to complete it by the end of the round. Mm -hmm. By the end of next round, if I'm still unable to complete it, which would be really bad, then this would fall off of danger and it'll be lost. Anything that I have on the card will get discarded and I essentially cannot score this card anymore. Yeah, you essentially wasted a bunch of actions and time acquiring the card and then losing it for nothing. Right. But... This card only requires one yellow resource, so I have, a, I have faith in us. I'm going to go ahead and put this under future, and that would end my action. But say now it's gotten back to my turn, and the wormhole looks like this. Unfortunately, the other B card is gone. Someone else drafted it, of course. It has been hate drafted. <laughs> I can now choose to take a second card, or alternatively, there are two other types of actions you can take on your turn during this phase. The first of which is activating a trigger switch. Now each player has one of, uh, of each of these three types of colors, red, blue, and yellow uh, trigger switches on their console. Mm -hmm. They all start the game in the inactive side. 
And so during this phase, instead of drafting a card, I can choose to flip one of these over. The significance of these, of these trigger switches is going to be more apparent during the second half of the, the round. But just know that if you're able to flip over all three of them, then you can turn them in for something nice. The third option, if I don't want to do that either, is I can build another tech module. So each player starts the game with the exact same uh, eight of these tech modules, mm -hmm. and they are each just one-time use powers. During setup, we're actually going to draw two of these, and you're going to choose one to put into play already to start the game, and the other one goes to the bottom of this pile. Yep. During the wormhole phase, as an action, I can choose to do the same thing. Draw the top two, look at them, choose one to put into play immediately, and then the other one goes to the bottom of your uh, tech module deck. And that's essentially it for the wormhole actions. Now let's just say I didn't do that actually, because mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to draft a second card. Sure. For my second wormhole action, I'm going to draft this Nexus card. So the Nexus cards are a little bit different. They are not past, present, and future. They do something a little bit tricky with the matrix, which we'll see. But when you draft the Nexus card, you're going to place it uh, under here where it says past slash Nexus, mm -hmm. because these also have a time limit. It's quite long, but it is still uh, in danger of being lost. I do want to mention that when you take a Nexus card, there is a dot uh, in a grid. All the Nexus cards look like this. And that pertains to the space in your matrix that you have to cover with one of these shield tokens. So mine just happens to be right in the center there. So I'm going to go ahead and place a shield token right at that spot. You'll see during the matrix phase how this affects your matrix. Once everyone has taken two actions in the wormhole phase, we then proceed to the matrix phase where everyone is going to take two matrix actions by manipulating their own personal matrix over here. Yeah, so starting with us, since we are still the chief scientist, mm -hmm. we're going to take both of our matrix actions and essentially try to configure our matrix so that we have like type colors in the same row or in the same column. And we do this by swapping the place of two tokens that have the same symbol. So if you look closely at these tokens, they have different colors on them, but they also have X's, O's, or triangles. And so as a matrix action, I can say, take this token right here, which has an X on it, and exchange it with another X on my board. And so I'm going to want to exchange it with this token right here, which is a yellow, because it forms a row of four yellow tokens all in the same row. This is also known as a strand. And this is very important because this is exactly how you gain resources in this game. Yes, that's right. And if you look at the card that we drafted, this requires one yellow paradox token. And so the way that this works is if you're able to form a row of four of the same color, you remove all of the tokens that form that row or column. And if you made it with four tokens, then you get to keep one of them. If you're able to do an entire row or column of five, then you get to keep two of them, which is a power move, but not the easiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. If it is a strand that is yellow, blue, or red, you get to activate that same colored trigger. So I get to flip over this yellow trigger right there, which is nice. Again, you must immediately assign the one token that we gained from that. So I'm going to go ahead and assign this to this card right here because that's what it requires. The other three are going to go right here on my uh, console to be placed back into the bag uh, once my turn is over. If when allocating your particle, you completed a card, which we did here because this only required one yellow particle, then you discard the particle and you flip your card face down into your scoring area because now that is definitely going to be yours to score at the end of the game. Before you do that though, you have to move the glitch marker on the multiverse board. And the number of spaces that you move it depends on whether the card was a past, present, or future card. Because this card was a future card, you only move it one space. And so if it were a past card, it would be five spaces, present cards are three spaces, and Nexus cards do not move the glitch marker at all. Mm -hmm. But we will talk about the Nexus cards in a second. Wherever the glitch marker lands, that planet becomes fractured, which is bad, unfortunately. So you just flip the, the planet over, and if it stays in this kind of like darkened out uh, looking position at the end of the game, then you end the game with a fractured planet, which is going to lower your score if you have any of those timeline cards, which is really, really bad for us because <laughs> This is literally the, the, the world that I'm trying to uh, complete. Yeah, that's right. I think you had just done a B and then now you fractured B. Yeah. That's wow. a problem. That was bad timing. There are ways in which you can try to fix this, which uh -huh. we'll get to in a second. Now back to our matrix. Because we have this missing row here, everything comes down. Just like a standard uh, um, matrix, Tetris. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> now because we have a shield marker on this token right here because of our Nexus card, these tokens don't fall but we do replace that spot with uh, tokens from the bag. And when you refill these tokens, you go from left to right, bottom to top. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna start here okay. and then fill in from left to right in the top row, like that. And that is, that's my first action.
Now I do have one more action because again, you get two matrix actions during this phase. And when taking these actions, instead of swapping two tokens from your matrix, you could swap a token from your matrix and the anomalies that are in the middle of the multiverse board. So I'm looking at my tech modules here and I have one that's called diagonal. Mm -hmm. For your next action, you may resolve a diagonal time strand. Well, guess what? During the matrix phase, you can spend um, your tech modules as a free action. Yep. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to spend this so that uh, for this action, I can resolve a diagonal time strand. So what I'll do is I'm going to swap this circle with the circle over here that's on a black token so that I can resolve this diagonal time strand because they are all black. Because if you may notice, you have two other colors besides red, blue, and yellow. Mm -hmm. You have black and white. The other significance of this is I'm trying to complete my Nexus card over here. In order for you to score a Nexus card, you have to complete a time strand that includes the shielded token on it. As long as this shield is on this token, I can never move this token on my matrix. It's going to be stuck there. That is locked in. It's yep. locked in. But for my second action, in conjunction with my diagonal uh, time strand tech module, I'm going to go ahead and complete this diagonal time strand. And it is a um, value of four, quantity four time strand in black, mm -hmm. and it completes my Nexus card. So I get to flip this over, and again, Nexus cards do not move the glitch marker. I do, however, get to collect these four, and uh, the significance with the black and the white tokens is you can spend them to protect worlds in the multiverse. So right now, I get one of these tokens. I can spend it to either place a shield on top of a, uh, a world that has not yet been fractured, yep. so that if the glitch marker ever lands on that world, instead of fracturing the world, you just remove the shield token. Exactly. In addition, at the end of the game, for every planet uh, whose timeline cards you have in your score pile, who has a shield token on it, you're going to get one point for each of these. Yep. So it's another way to score points. But I'm actually going to turn in this token for the third uh, use, which is repairing a fractured world. So I'm just going to go ahead and flip over B, um, because that was a world that was very important to me. Right, so you're not going to put a shield on it, you just right. uncover it to go back to its normal state. Exactly. And of course, the other significance with the black and white tokens is some of the uh, timeline cards give you a wild uh, requirement. So this is three tokens of any color, red, blue, yellow, white, or black. Mm -hmm. So you can use it, them for those as well. Yep. And of course, once I complete my action, all the matrix tokens drops down, and then you refill them from the bag accordingly. And now that I've completed my two actions, if I had any cards left over here, they would all move one space over. And again, any of the cards that are in the danger zone would fall off the console and be lost forever. Now there are two last things I didn't mention that are considered free actions during the matrix phase. And they are, if all three of your triggers are activated, you can flip them all over to take a purple token here. And these are considered wild. You have to assign them immediately. So you can either discard them to manipulate the multiverse, or you can assign them to a timeline card that is already in your console. Or I can just hold off for a later turn where I can use that as a free action to do it then. The last thing is as a free action, if I completed a strand and maybe I don't have a place to assign it to, I can form an alliance by taking the same colored alliance token, and then I can use it in the future as a single resource of that color. But if I have it at the end of the game, then it's also worth one point. Once all players have completed their matrix phase, then we go into cleanup, which is essentially putting all your paradox tokens back in the bag and uh, flushing the wormhole, because we're going to have a new set of wormhole cards every round. That's actually the timer of the game. Mm -hmm. If ever you run out of cards in the draw deck to fill in the wormhole, yep. then that's going to trigger the end of the game. And each player gets one final matrix action. And then you go into end game scoring. And so the first thing that happens during final scoring is players must pay a penalty for any fractured worlds that are still fractured at the end of the game. Yeah, so if the end game looked like this and the H was like this, then whoever has an H card in their hand must discard one of them. Right, and that's going to be dependent on the way that people play around the table. There may be more fractured worlds than this, most likely. Most likely. Or if you're you know, very good about that, then maybe not. Since H is the only world that's fractured, um, I'm going to go into my scoring pile, which will hopefully be way more than this <laughs> yes. by the end of the game. Uh -huh. And then I must discard one card from the H set. So I only have one card, unfortunately. It is my Nexus card. I have to toss it, and I will not score any points for the H world. And of course, you do this for each fractured world. After that, then you score your regular world cards. Mm -hmm. So you take whatever's left of your score pile, and for each world, you're going to count the number of cards that you have in that set, regardless of whether or not it's a past, present, future, or nexus card. Mm -hmm. As long as it belongs to the set of a world on the table, yep. then you score points for them. Yeah, so you're going to score one, three, six, or ten if you have the full set. Right. 
In addition, for each world that is shielded at the end of the game, meaning it has a shield token on it, as long as you have one card still left in your score pile from that world, you'll get one point. Then you score the three research goals. So these are goal cards that we did not really talk much on, but they're basically public uh, objectives. Mm -hmm. And so there's always going to be three of them uh, for every game that you play. And these cards are randomly selected from a larger deck. So every time you play, there's going to be a different set. Mm -hmm. And they're each assigned to Alpha, Beta, or Delta over here. This card is going to score you points for every past uh, timeline card that you have in your score pile at the end of the game. Because it's in the Alpha position, for each card that you have that's a past card, you're gonna get one victory point. Mm -hmm. That is the exchange. This card over here is a little bit different. This is gonna score you points depending on exotic materials. And that's gonna be for this symbol found at the top right hand corner of your card. But because it's a beta goal, it's gonna score you three victory points for every two of these that you have. So it's a little bit more points per card, but you have to have uh, two of them to score. And finally, this delta goal over here, it's going to award you points for advanced weaponry. So that's going to be this symbol on your cards. And for every three of these that you have in your score pile, it'll score you six points. So uh, big goal, but big reward as well. And so as you can see, the various scoring conditions are going to dictate the way that you draft cards from the wormhole and uh, really guide your gameplay. And last but not least, any leftover alliance tokens that you're in possession of grant you one victory point. Yes, at that point, whoever has the most points wins. Mm -hmm. And there you have it. That is how you play the Paradox Initiative. Now, there are a couple of things that we did not discuss during the teach today, namely parallel universes, as well as research projects, which are a, a certain type of basic timeline card that you mm -hmm. don't score points for at the end of the game. But when you complete them, they give you mid-game bonuses. Mm -hmm. So they're still a, a pretty pertinent part of your strategy when playing the game. In addition to this, this game also comes with solo rules, as well as an alternate way to set up the deck for two players, which includes an alternate timeline for the wormhole. And in addition to those things, this version of the game does come with additional new changes, which are all detailed in the Kickstarter. So if you're interested in checking out more about the game, as well as the campaign, we've included a link to the Kickstarter down below, which again begins on April 12th. Thank you so much for watching our video today. We hope it was helpful. If you are interested in this game and you have questions, feel free to leave them in the comments down below and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. And if you do like these kind of videos and you want to see more in the future, please consider subscribing. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.